Hello everybody, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And Jesus is that light of life. Today is March 23rd. It's a Monday. Everybody's freaking out over the corona thing. Um... Oh, I don't know what's going to happen, but uh, I suspect possibly the internet will probably go down. You never know. But uh, this is going to be the commentary on Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14, which is the last final chapter in this book. Uh, there's a lot of messianic prophecies in this book and this is you know minor prophets old testament you know people uh people uh will tell you they're new testament christians well they're idiots because the whole bible is one book the new testament was pointed to from the old testament all right so let's get going here Verse 1, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. Now, there's people that'll tell you that the day of Christ and the day of the Lord are two different events. They'll tell you that the day of, the, day of Christ is the pre-trib rapture and the day of the Lord is when the Lord returns in glory to start the 1,000-year reign of Christ on earth. But essentially what they're doing is denying that Jesus Christ is Lord. I mean, if you're going to tell me that the day of Christ and the day of the Lord is two different events, basically they're denying that Jesus Christ is Lord, my opinion anyways. You know, Jesus doesn't come back one and a half times. And, you know, it's called the second coming. He comes back in the clouds with all his saints with him once. That's what happens. He doesn't come halfway and then rapture everybody up and then they go eat in heaven and then they're having the marriage supper of the Lamb while people on earth are dying for their faith in Christ during the tribulation, what they call tribulation saints. Because if that happened, they would miss the marriage supper of the Lamb. Can you imagine people dying for their faith in Christ and they miss the marriage supper of the Lamb? No, it doesn't happen. That only happens in demon-nominational churches that are actually 501c3, IRS-approved, state-chartered corporations that just happen to have the name church in it. There are no more churches than Federal Express is part of the federal government. It just has the name federal in the name. And that's what these are. They're just churches in name only. They're state approved, IRS approved, tax exempt corporations. And that pre-trib rapture thing only happens in their minds. Actually people, you know what? When you uh, figure out that there is no pre-trib rapture and you know a preacher that taught this stuff as fact, that makes him a false prophet. And guess what? According to the Word of God, you were to take stones and kill false prophets. You know what? And if you carry that out, all you got to do is say, hey, Chaplain Bob said, you know, and he was just quote, you know, the scriptures. And uh, I will take responsibility. Trust me. And, uh, Trust me, the Lord knows his scriptures better than I do. A lot, quite a bit better. I wish I knew 0.00001% as well as the Lord did. Well, 1% would be nice. All right, so now let's take a look. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Now, 
when you take a look at the book of Jeremiah, uh, this is kind of like what happened in Jeremiah. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not sure if this is past or will be present in the end times, you know, the future. But let's take a look. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Now, a lot of people will tell you, oh, well, this is the Lord protecting his chosen people, the you-know-whos, the Antichrist over in the Middle East. I don't believe that. I think he's returning in, uh, in the clouds with glory, coming to earth with a cloud of witnesses, all the saints, and I think the earth is gathering their armies together to fight the Lord when he's coming down. That's what I think is happening here. I don't think the Lord's protecting Jerusalem per se. I think he's protecting his saints from those that are going to battle against him. But your demon nominational preachers will tell you, oh, well, you, he's, he's coming down to protect Jerusalem. Eh, if you want to believe that, that's fine. You know, I could be wrong. Of course, God does have his remnant. Uh, there is, in the book of Revelation, there is, um, during the plagues, there's going to be, I think it's seven or 8,000 in Jerusalem that will give glory to God. You know, so that's going to be less than probably 1% of the city's population. God has his remnant in Jerusalem. You know what? It might end up being Palestinians. You never know. After all, um, I've heard 15% of the Palestinians are Christians. What can I tell you? Verse 3, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Verse 4, Messianic prophecy here. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. So when you take the Mount of Olives, there's going to be like, it's going to be like an earthquake going from east to west. Um, a huge crack okay and there shall be a very great valley and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south now remember the north kingdom of Israel and then you had the south kingdom of Judah now what about the Mount of Olives uh, some people say that the Sermon on the Mount. I think it's Matthew chapter 5 and chapter 6. Some people say that the Sermon on the Mount was on the Mount Olives. But uh, what else happened on, you know, Christ is returning in glory to the Mount of Olives. Well, what other significant things are there about the Mount of Olives? Well, let's go take a look. Acts chapter 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, taken up. After that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. That's right. Christ made the choice. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days. Remember, he was tempted in the desert forty days. Uh, forty days and forty nights was the flood of Noah. You know, forty. It's there's some uh, heavy duty stuff with the numbers there on you know forty. And speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait 
for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. Verse 5, for, God, uh, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Ah, the Lord's going to return and restore the kingdom to Israel. N sorry, not the United Nations. 1948 didn't happen. Unless you want to tell me that the United Nations is your Lord and Savior. If it is, then that little state over in the Middle East is your is then your Lord and Savior, the regathering of his, the kingdom to Israel. Verse 7. But he, Jesus, said unto them, It is not for you to know the time or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria. And what was Samaria? Samaria was the capital of northern Israel. Jerusalem was the capital of Judah, the southern kingdom. Samaria, the northern kingdom. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. He was taken up, and a cloud, a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Now these are angels, okay? Which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so, shall so come in like manner, as ye have seen him go into heaven. That's right. You see him going up to heaven in the clouds. He's going to return in heaven in the clouds. Okay? Which is taken up from you into heaven, so sh shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Verse 12, here's the punchline. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. Christ left from Mount Olivet, the Mount of Olives. He left to go to heaven from, he, he left earth to go into heaven from Mount, the Mount of Olives, Mount Olivet. And he's going to return the same way he left to the same place, Mount Olivet, the Mount of Olives. Keep that in mind. All right, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting in verse 15. Very important, people. Pre-trib rapture churches, false prophets will never teach you this. Or if they do, they'll twist it. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, which we which are alive and remain unto the coming, the coming of the Lord, shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Oh yeah, all secret raptures come with a shout. With the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. Sorry, not Donald. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Christ went up in the clouds. Christ is going to return in the clouds. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, I know I've beat this to death, 
But if we're not caught up to get, uh, if we're not caught up in the clouds with the Lord, it's the wrong Messiah. Real easy. Period. Nobody teaches hard this hardly. All right. Uh, Hebrews 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Oh boy, there's a race set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. All right. Now, Zechariah 14, verse 4. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. Verse 5. And ye shall flee to the valley of of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. Yea, you shall flee, like as ye fled from before the earthquakes in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all, and all the saints with thee, with thee. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark. But it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor light, nor night, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. All right, uh, let's see. Let's see, Zechariah. All right, verse 8. And in that day, and it shall be in that day that living waters, living waters, shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea. In summer and in winter shall it be. Now, where do we read about that in the New Testament? Revelation 22, verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life. A pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life. Tree of life. Where did we read about the tree of life? Genesis chapter 2, I believe which bear twelve manner of fruits. Twelve manner of fruits, twelve tribes of Israel, twelve months in the year. And yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. What nations? The twelve tribes of Israel nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Uh, let's see. All right, let's go back to Zechariah 14. Uh, verse 9. All right. All right, so living waters will go forth, uh, go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea. In summer and winter it shall be, shall it be, verse 9, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. Oh yeah, Satan's lease ran out. All right, so verse 9, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. All the land shall be turned as a plain from Geba to Rimmon, south of Jerusalem, and it shall be lifted up and inhabited in her place from Benjamin's gate unto the place of the first gate, unto the corner gate, and from the tower of Hananiel unto the king's winepress. 
and men shall dwell in it, and there shall be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. You know what? That reminds me of the scene in the Terminator movie when Sarah Connor's at the playground and the nuke went off. And uh, that's what it reminds me of. I don't watch too many movies, but uh, Terminator was one of them that I really enjoyed at the time. So, But to me, that sounds just like a nuclear thing but you know it's not it's the lord's right so and it shall come to pass in that day that a great tumult from the lord shall be among them and they shall lay hold every one on the hand of his neighbor and his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbor and judah also shall fight at jerusalem and the wealth of all the heathen and the wealth of all the heathen round about shall be gathered together gold and silver and apparel in great abundance oh yeah all you bankers Oh, the, the heathens, yeah. Their wealth is going to be ours, people. And so shall be the plague of the horse, of the mule, of the camel, of, of the ass, and of all the beasts that shall be in these tents as this plague. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacle. Oh, yeah, you're going to keep the Feast of Tabernacles in the um, kingdom during the millennial reign. Uh, I, I, it's very possible that the Lord was born on the Feast of Tabernacles or conceived. I, I don't know. But that's just my opinion. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. So anybody, uh, if a nation doesn't come up to worship the king on the Feast of Tabernacles, they're not going to get any rain. Verse 18, And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, they have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and a punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So in the kingdom, they're going to be keeping the Feast of Tabernacles. In that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord, and the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowels, the bowls, shall be like the bowls before the altar, Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness, holiness unto the Lord of hosts. And all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and see therein. Listen carefully. And in that day, and in that day, there shall be no more, no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. There ain't going to be no Canaanites in the Lord of Lord's house in this day. They're going to be destroyed. And uh, your churches that teach whosoever will, why they teach you that the Canaanites can be saved. All they got to do is believe in Jesus and give their heart to Jesus and do a little 30 second center prayer and they're saved. Praise the Jesus. That's what they'll tell you. Yeah, I'm mocking them. No. The Canaanites are the satanic seed line, people. Genesis 6. Read Genesis 6, sons of God. Contrast that to Job 38. The sons of God shouted for joy at the creation of the earth. Adam did not come until six days after. So the sons of God have to be angels. Besides, who was their father? God was. And uh, for as long as I'm on YouTube, you can look at my playlist, The Angels That Sinned. Genesis 6, it's on my homepage under playlists. Uh, it's like a probably a 10 or 12 hour study. It proves this point. The Canaanites were, the Philistines were one of the tribes of the Canaanites. They were giants. I'm sorry, but you know, these demon nominational preachers will tell you that 
well, you know, the sons of God were godly men, but then the daughters of men were those ungodly women. So all the godly men got together and had got married to all these ungodly women because, you know, all the men were godly and all the women were ungodly. And then when they had children, they were giants. Really? Th that's what they want us to believe. No. No. That's not how it works, people. When believers and unbelievers get married, they don't have giants for children. Okay? Every culture in the world has legends of giants. Greeks, the Romans, even the Norsemen, the Vikings and stuff, you know, the frost giants, uh, they were the giants that lived in the cold areas. Uh, but they all have legends. All, all over the world, they've got legends of giants. You know, and the Bible records them too. And then God told them to exterminate them. But not all the Canaanite tribes are giants. So there's not going to be any Canaanites in the kingdom. And I suspect the Canaanites today are calling themselves Christians, Muslims, and the, uh, and the chosen people of God. The self-chosen. But, hey, that's just my opinion. So... We'll find out one day. But there's not going to be any Canaanites in God's kingdom. They're going to be exterminated. And I'm sorry, but the whosoever will, the free will churches, they're wrong. They are wrong. Canaanites are satanic hybrids. They have no offer of salvation. The angels have no salvational offer either. Just not going to happen. They're hybrids. God says a bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. And when you look up bastard, it means mixed mongrel. It doesn't mean that a woman got pregnant because unmarried. No, that's the modern interpretation. So, all right, well, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and his only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world in his precious name. Amen.